and welcome to today's webinar, Principles of Fundraising, Navigating the Challenges Presented by Coronavirus. My name is Brian Leamy. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development at CCS Fundraising. And before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items uh, so you can participate actively in today's session. Uh, you see on the screen uh, a, a snapshot of your admin interface where uh, you've got choices to uh, join via phone or via computer audio. Uh, please take a look at those uh, details and if you have any kinds of audio problems, you might want to uh, pivot to uh, another method of, of access. More importantly, below the audio section of your administrative window is the questions prompt. And this is how we're going to collect all of the questions uh, from each of you uh, throughout the webinar. You can enter your question into that uh, text box in the middle of your admin window uh, at any time during the webinar. And at the end of our session, we're going to conduct a Q&A uh, and try to answer as many of those questions as we can. Um, and then finally, after this session, we will be recording the webinar and sharing a copy of that recording along with uh, the slides and, and materials used for this presentation. Uh, and finally, any of the questions that have been submitted to us throughout this session that do not get uh, answered, uh, we will have someone from CCS make sure that they respond to you uh, with a reply to that question. And so with all of that housekeeping out of the way, uh, I'm pleased to introduce the first of today's presenters, uh, Bob Kassane, the chairman of CCS Fundraising. Bob? Uh, thanks, Brian, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, also joining me today uh, are uh, two of our most talented and experienced executives, Rick Happy, uh, Senior Managing Director and Principal, who heads our West Coast operations, from our San Francisco office, and Lindsay Marsanak, the managing director and partner in our Chicago office. I'm uh, based in New York City at our, our headquarters. Uh, before we begin, uh, I want to express on behalf of all of us at CCS, our concern and best wishes to you, your families, your colleagues, and the important constituencies that you serve. Uh, we work so closely together Many people on this call are good friends, personal friends, and we understand the stress that we're feeling at this time and the challenges that are in front of us. We're so grateful for your trust and confident that together we can rise to this challenge. Uh, we will most assuredly get through this together. Uh, we, need, we just need to keep focused, uh, be positive, be really positive, confident, uh, with our eye on the prize. Partici the participants listening in on this webinar represent the rich diversity of our society and the full spectrum of the philanthropic sector. There are very large organizations on the call, and there are ones of uh, moderate and smaller sizes. There are institutions on this call, a webinar, who are on the front lines of the crisis and others who are temporarily on hold. Some theaters have shut down and other entities are really um, stopped for the moment. So there's no singular strategy that can apply here for all, as there never is a blanket solution to any fundraising challenge. But there are guidelines, guiding principles, which can lead to effective action. In the next 30 minutes, we hope to share with you our experiences over many years dealing in times of crisis. We will provide general guidelines and specific recommendations on how you might think about responding in these uncertain times. I'll begin for a few minutes with reflections on learnings from past crises. Then I'll turn it over to Rick, uh, who will focus on some of the unique implications of the current situation. Finally, we will turn to Lindsay, who will take us through a set of strategies for moving forward in the current environment, concrete strategies that we hope are, you find useful and employable. For this call, we are focusing on this issue from a public health perspective and the immediate implications of physical distancing. Our suggestions will focus around that. Should this become a prolonged economic slump, we can address that issue in future webinars and publications. For now, Let's deal what we have with what we have right in front of us. 
CCS has extensive experience over the past 70 years dealing with times of crisis, from natural disasters to terrorist attacks and economic stress. While this particular crisis is unique, we believe there's much to learn from the lessons of 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, the economic crisis of 2008, and other emergencies and disasters where, in our experience, uh, we've seen organizations overcome uh, these challenges. How have nonprofit organizations navigated difficult waters and uncertain times? What principles guided them to sounder shores? And what quality, qualities did they embrace to help them get there? The answer to these questions were, were center around four major themes. First, communication. The importance of continuous communication and engagement with stakeholders. Secondly, the need for prudent adjustments to short-term fundraising activities. You gotta make some changes. Thirdly, strong, decisive, resilient leadership. And fourthly, a commitment to staying the course of an institution's overall fundraising goals and plans. Let me repeat that, staying the course. If we dive a bit deeper, what do past crises tell us? Well, first they tell us, they strongly reinforce the basic principle that people give to people and giving is a two-way street. Donors want to know how this crisis is affecting your organization and how you are caring for your employees and those you serve. Equally, donors want to know that you value them and are concerned about their welfare. A personal phone call or an email can do wonders. Personal outreach at this time can have very meaningful positive effects. Challenging times offer an opportunity for organizations to strengthen and cement their relationships with their stakeholders. We've seen many instances where a crisis created a lasting bond between leaders and donors and opens a whole new dimension to a relationship. Challenging times offer an opportunity for organizations to affirm their mission and to demonstrate their relevance. We saw this in no small way here in New York immediately after 9-11. Relevance can be quite direct and immediate, as in health services, support services, and care, but it can also have sizable spiritual and cultural dimensions as well, providing much needed solace, inspiration, and reassurance. In uncertain times, donors look to their beloved charities as vital resources. They look to nonprofits to provide valuable information and advice, health services, education assistance and support, as well as cultural enrichment, spiritual guidance, and advocacy for our most vulnerable. We have learned quite definitively that those nonprofit organizations that stay the course and keep their stakeholders engaged ultimately emerge from a crisis successfully. In past crises, we learned the hard way that donors who stop supporting specific nonprofits during or after a crisis did so primarily because they no longer felt connected. Let me repeat that one. We learned the hard way that donors who stop supporting specific nonprofits during or after a crisis did so primarily because they no longer felt connected. In fact, two thirds of donors who stopped giving to specific causes after the 2008 crisis, according to a survey of major donors across the US, did so because they no longer felt connected. This last point is particularly important as it may feel like now is the time to pause, to disengage or to lay low. It is very critical to note that in previous downturns, those organizations that put, continued to push forward appropriately ultimately succeeded and those who took a step back lost considerable ground. So let me conclude and in a moment turn it over to Rick by pointing out that the impact of this coronavirus, uh, coronavirus pandemic underscores the nonprofit sector's vital leadership role in the health and welfare of our communities. That is why it is so important for nonprofit organizations to engage with their stakeholders, to communicate the impact of this crisis on both the organization itself and on its beneficiaries, and to invite 
stakeholders to help in appropriate and meaningful ways. With that, let me turn it over to Rick Happy, who will talk about the specific and unique implications of the current situation. Rick? Thanks. Thanks very much, Bob, and thank you to all of you for joining this webinar this afternoon. Uh, I want to just say thank you for all you're doing in our sector and uh, your commitment to uh, confronting this and, and working through this. What does all this mean? How do we move forward today with everything that's transpired in the last couple of months, the last couple of weeks, the last couple of days even? As you heard from Bob, there's a lot of valuable lessons from past events that can help guide us. As you're going to hear from Lindsay in a minute, there are a lot of terrific strategies that she's going to suggest for guidance moving forward. But back to the implications of the current situation. Let's remember that fundraising is a contact sport, and we just shut down the physical contact. Now, we've heard the term social distancing. It's not really social distancing. It's physical distancing. I was on three Zoom calls this morning uh, with client partners, and they these these calls, these, these were meetings. One was a board meeting, two were committee meetings. And they looked just like a board meeting and just like a committee meeting, except everybody was at home, and, uh, but everybody was connected. There were decks. People were asking questions. There was conversation. So we've shut down the physical part of it, but not the social part of it. And that's an important distinction. Now, we're canceling special events like galas and auctions. Falls. We're moving back board retreats and seminars. We're not doing groundbreakings or grand openings. You know, we're not holding small dinners or cocktail parties. But there are other things that we can do as we think about these implications. Special appeals are appropriate. Uh, people will expect it. It's important to do it with care and love and kindness and appreciation, but they are important nonetheless. Organizations need to let their donors know how the situation is affecting the organization, and how the organization is dealing with it. Your donors and friends are interested in knowing how you're responding to the situation. A class is canceled, events canceled, services or performances being altered or canceled. How are employees being cared for? How are operations affected? If any new services or programs are being cut back or eliminated? Donors and friends want to help and will want to help. I want to just say a special thanks, a word of thanks to those of you who work in hospitals, healthcare organizations, social service and human service organizations who are really on the front lines of what's happening today. Your donors and stakeholders need to know the special role that you all are playing and the institutions are playing. And I would also say to those of you who have family and friends and loved ones who are first responders, who work at Safeway, who work at the local pharmacy and are under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure uh, given these events to thank them too because they are really helping us and helping us get through that and that's often overlooked. One implication from this is some folks may say, just shut it down, you know, pause, pause fundraising, pause giving, cancel, postpone until we're through this. Well, it's a lot easier said than done. You just can't shut it down and that would be a mistake. As Bob alluded to in his remarks, about what we experienced in 2008, 2009, and 2010, institutions made some poor decisions during that period that affected them negatively over the long term. So we really want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the big picture. One of the campaign chairs with whom we're working kept saying during yesterday's meeting, keep our eyes on the prize. That's important. I try to think of it this way since I'm a baseball fan. And I'm an Oakland A's fan, so that means the season never ends with us winning the World Series, well, at least in the last 30 years or so. But after the season ends, the, pay, the players pack up, they go home, but they start working out immediately. They start batting practice or weightlifting or throwing sessions. The team doesn't pack up and go home. They start planning for the next season the day after the last season ends. So this period of time that we're in right now, and we recognize there's, it's un, there's uncertainties and anxieties, it does allow us to reach out to people, reflect, plan ahead, maybe think further ahead than tomorrow's advancement committee meeting, and to think about the next three months, the next six months, the next nine months. It's very important to connect with colleagues and friends. It's obviously important to connect with family and people you haven't connected with in some time. Let me just give you a little personal perspective. Two of my kids go to fabulous universities, Wake Forest and Miami of Ohio. These two schools have over-communicated to them and to us. I mean, every day, it's either a video, an email update, a podcast, a touch base. 
And it's really helped. And it means something. The kids are home now, but the schools are in touch constantly. And it's made me, not an alumnus of either, feel closer to each and a better prospect to each. My alma mater did the same thing with me this morning. Wanted to check in, see how we were doing, tell me what was happening on campus, how they were handling it with the kids, with the employees, with the faculty. It was really nice and it meant something, something that we're gonna remember. Now let me turn it over to my partner, Lindsay Marciniak, who is gonna talk about specific strategies for going forward. Take it away, Lindsay. Thank you, Rick. In light of the current and very rapidly evolving circumstances in our world today, we wanted to provide 10 actionable strategies, which very much are in line with the four themes that Bob mentioned previously and many of the key points that Rick just emphasized. And we'll walk through each of these 10. First, increase your communication. Keep your stakeholders fully informed and deeply engaged during this time. Donors want to know how your organization is affected. And they want to know what you're doing to respond. We heard this just this week with one of our client partners who in reaching out to one of their donors was so surprised that the donor wanted to talk about the organization, and wanted to hear what was going on and demonstrated real care and concern. Where possible in your communication, be as personal as you can. Phone calls are best. And within these phone calls, start with a human moment. Ask how the person is doing. Ask for their advice. Ask for their reactions. More than anything, that kind of human connection really helps to build and grow the relationship. If you are looking to expand to a wider audience, you can use emails. We encourage you to use emails with a specific call to action or links that can help people read and absorb and also respond accordingly. Similarly, our second point is also about communication, specifically to communicate the immediate and short-term financial impact that is happening on your organization in this time of the global health pandemic. We know that some institutions like food banks may sustain or even grow revenue during this time, while other institutions, like those dependent on earned revenue, are facing a very different reality. Many of you are currently reviewing your budgets at the end of the quarter. You're mobilizing new resources in response to the crisis. And many of you are currently reforecasting your fiscal year revenue. As you're doing that, try to pull forward one or two key messages that you can share with your stakeholders to help them understand the weekly or even daily toll that this crisis is having on your organizational revenue. And in some cases, what's required for you to make, meet payroll or continue your programs and services over the next several weeks and months. At the very least, this kind of messaging can set the stage for any type of special fundraising appeals that you may need to send in the future. Our third tip is to leverage technology. While we are physically distant, we can stay socially connected. As Rick mentioned in his example, we're seeing more and more opportunity to incorporate video conferencing, podcasts, and other virtual tools to help maintain meetings and encourage a dynamic interaction. Don't assume that people don't know how to use these platforms or that people don't want to use these platforms. We're all working in a new day and we're finding new opportunities to utilize these tools. We're hearing from our client partners that tools like Zoom, GoToMeeting, and Google Hangouts are very popular because they also offer, in many cases, a free platform. There are many timely articles posted now about how to run a successful virtual meeting. You can read those and get some new tips. There are also tools like Miro and Mural that are collaborative whiteboards that you can use for more internal discussions and brainstorms. Additionally, utilize videos short videos that you can post to your website and push out through your social media channels. In these days, we're seeing more informal phone recordings, which are very general, uh, very genuine and very real time. 
It doesn't need to be overly produced or polished. Additionally, we're also seeing Facebook Live lessons becoming increasingly popular. And consider how you might be able to connect with your own constituents through a virtual platform. We're also seeing that many performing arts institutions and museums are starting to use virtual reality to take tours or to give exposure in ways that cannot be possible while we're all being physically distant. Our fourth tip is to consider special fundraising initiatives. Where appropriate and in special instances, you may want to consider a special appeal targeted toward immediate relief efforts and initiatives that are directly related in this time of crisis. This could be conducted via email to ensure that it's real time and it can also limit costs. If you're making personal phone calls, that can yield an opportunity to talk about different initiatives that are underway to ensure that your mission is carried forward during these times. If you have a giving day planned, we encourage you to keep that giving day and adjust your messaging accordingly. Overall, if you are planning a special fundraising initiative, we encourage you to frame messaging that's related to the current situation and related to your mission, which will create both a meaningful and an appropriate sense of relevance and urgency during these times. As a fifth tip, we also encourage you to consider special briefings which can be a series of teleconferences with board meetings, committee meetings, or even town halls. Again, donors and constituents are interested to know how you're responding. So using these platforms to share updates on your general operations, provide real-time updates on any adjustments to your classes and events and services, and also to share what you're doing to care for your constituents and stakeholders. If you're offering any new services or programs, you can also share these in your special briefings. The sixth point, which has been noted before and really needs to be underscored here, is to avoid wholesale cancellation of your fundraising plans. Certainly, this is a time to adjust and exercise flexibility, but not a time for brash decisions. You may consider extending timelines or adjusting goals, but we do not advise canceling anything wholesale. Remember, we're all learning and responding in real time. Each day is different than the next, and we can't predict the future. And so being able to look at things on a day-by-day -day basis and a week-by-week -week basis will allow you to best adjust and respond accordingly. To that end, our seventh point is to develop a short-term action plan. With things happening so rapidly, it's helpful to develop a day-by-day, week-by-week plan that could evolve into a 30, a 60, or even a 90-day plan, as shown on the screen. It can feature different outreach touch points, such as personal calls and emails to your constituents, as well as even internal communication. During these times of rapid change, it's very important to consider frequent and often short touch points with your staff and internal leaders so that you can all stay abreast of all of the rapidly changing information and respond. Our eighth tip is to reaffirm your mission and your impact. The work you do as, in, as you all do every day is so important today. Your work is important to communicate and remind your donors and constituents. And if you have a special role to play in the current global health issue, explain it and relate to it. For example, many food banks are reaching out to seniors and other vulnerable populations to ensure they have healthy food. We know that many schools are providing and amplifying scholarships and special assistance funds to provide much needed assistance to families in need. And we know that many faith-based institutions are working to find new platforms to provide spiritual guidance. So really showcase your mission and the impact of your work. Our ninth tip is to motivate your key stakeholders. Leadership is so important during this time. It starts with your board and it starts with your leaders. It sets the tone and can really influence the, the messaging and motivation at all levels of your organization. During this time, you can motivate your trustees 
by drawing upon stories from your own organization, as well as other stories through your peers and through industry publications about the resilience of philanthropy during these times. We know that there have been a number of different organizations partnering together to create response funds and have seen incredible support of those funds to date. These kinds of stories can really help motivate and provide perspective. As you're speaking to your stakeholders and key decision makers, ask for their advice. Ask for their feedback from your board members and other advisors. Stakeholders who feel engaged will remain connected, especially in times of crisis. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, show empathy and concern. We are all impacted during this time, and people are craving a human connection. It's important to be empathetic and responsive to the very human needs that we are all feeling. Your genuine care for others goes such a long way, especially in these uncertain and rapidly changing times. And by utilizing that empathy and human connection and working together, we can and we certainly will come out stronger after this. With that said, I'd like to turn it back to Brian to field some questions and discussion. Lindsay, thanks so much, and thanks to Bob and Rick for sharing uh, this history and, and some of the lessons that we've been able to learn. Um, a reminder, if you have a question, please go to your uh, admin uh, question text box and enter it there. Uh, we have been collecting dozens and dozens of questions throughout uh, the webinar today. Uh, we will be uh, sending out a recorded version of this webinar along with the slide materials and we will be for any questions that we're not able to answer live today uh, following up individually with each of you who have asked these questions we'll make sure someone from CCS fundraising gets you a response um, I think we've got time for maybe three or four questions and so uh, let me engage the panel with each of them uh, I'll start with Bob and Bob, we've got a question about marketing uh, and some outreach, and, and uh, specifically they're asking, we were told not to spend money on marketing and not to send our magazine to uh, 15,000 households. Uh, what would be the right thing to do in this moment? Well, I think this is a general thanks. Thanks so much for that, Brian. Uh, I don't know if I can answer specifically whether to send a specific document, but just in general, I think you take take the perspective that businesses take right now, which is that in you know competitive or uncertain times, you just do not pull back on advertising and marketing. You, you're you're trying to communicate and almost over communicate at this point. So if uh, if that particular publication is still appropriate, you know that there'd be no reason not to send it, um, it might need to be changed. It might need to be modified in such a way, even if it's just a introductory cover, you know, statement about, you know, what's happening at this moment, because you need, you need to be relevant. Um, in messaging, you know, you're trying to communicate, you know, a personal, you know, empathy for people. You're trying to provide some inf current information and if appropriate, you know, to even uh, solicit an appeal. So, as Rick said so well, uh, I think that you'd want to um, look at the appeals you're planning, and before I would shut them down, I would absolutely think about how you would do them differently. Like what what would be different content, but with a uh, an urgency to it and an imperative to it. Thanks so much, Bob. I'm going to turn to Rick for this next question because actually, in your uh, remarks. You alluded to uh, the fact that we've got some some what might be considered downtime, um, and so this question is about uh, the activities and specific tactics um, that a development team can be doing during this unusual moment. Are there tactics you suggest that might be done remotely, uh, but that can set us up for success once we're back to business as usual? Rick? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I think there's a lot, and I think that there's I, I've seen some really good tactics and messaging already. And it all starts with people who, as I said earlier, are reaching out, are connecting with um, their friends, their donors, their board members, their colleagues, 
how are you doing? Everything okay? Taking care of yourself? Those kinds of things. Let me tell you what's happening here on campus. Let me tell you what's happening here at the hospital, what we're doing to respond to this crisis. Let me tell you what's happening here at the food bank and what we're doing. I think donors really want to hear that. And I think the development team can measure their um, progress and their success just like you would if this wasn't occurring. You know, setting goals for how many calls or Zoom conferences or Zoom uh, discussions or Ring Central that you can have in a day, emails that you can send in a day. And I would personalize them and I would tailor them for individuals. I wouldn't send out kind of mass emails. Uh, I would, I would, I would really make sure they're customized because that's going to help. I think with pe make people feel better and know that you're thinking about them. So I actually believe for our development team colleagues, there's a lot to do right now, and you know we've got to be mindful that we're all in this together. But you know, you guys are getting appropriate amount of sleep. You know, you're uh, you're managing this stress and anxiety. You all have you know families as well to take care of and to look after. So that's an important piece of this too but i think it's energizing and i'm finding for myself it's energizing to be co communicating with people and connecting with people and talking about things hey once we're past this this is what we're going to do this is what we're going to focus on or for the next two weeks this is what we need to focus on the next two weeks after that this is what we need to focus on i think that's going to help keep us energized it's going to help keep us um, our spirits up and keep us a little bit more optimistic as we move through this Great, thanks so much, Rick. Um, the next question is actually related to the marketing question a little bit, so I'm gonna throw this back to Bob again. Uh, Bob, this one's about the messaging itself. Um, do you have examples of, of good messages uh, to donors that we might be able to share, uh, or in particular, is there a certain kind of phrasing uh, that we might want to employ so as not to sound insensitive in this moment? Yeah, thank you, Brian. Really important uh, question. Uh, yeah, we've se we've se yes, we've seen uh, messages. Again, it depends on the kind of institution um, and how you know appropriate it would be for them to uh, you know go beyond simply inf informing people to uh, making any kind of a, a request for support. But uh, so in the healthcare field. Obviously, we've seen where there's been terrific communication, not only about what's happening, how to take care of yourself, um, and what initiatives are taking place at the institution, but there have been fund, special funds established for research and for uh, you know, public information and for some other support services. So those are those messages. Uh, fit again this this idea of personal, then informational, and then in those instances there are direct appeals for support. Uh, in other uh, circumstances, we've seen again the personal uh, uh, concern, and then information as Lindsay and Rick have laid out about you know what's happening with our programs and we're canceling this, we're moving this, we're moving that. Um, I would think about this in those three ways and uh, you know make a list first of all of uh, who needs a phone call so if you depending on the size of the organization you think of this in terms of you know we, uh, levels of personal right so it's a phone call it's a personal email it's a more generalized email publications and updates and then podcast webinars and videos and you may determine as an organization that you just want to make 25, 50, 100 phone calls that are purely checking on people and just expressing again empathy and just want to make sure you're you're okay. Uh, the second tier would you take it to information, which is here's what we're doing, here's what's happening, here's uh, any special things that we're doing, and then the third is this idea of personal, informational and then a request. And the tone that I've seen that's very effective is to use this terminology, some have asked us how they can help. And we've established this fund, these three funds, we, we've established this in order to respond. So there is this idea of, you know, there is interest in how people can help, and here's how you can help at this time. 
Thank you, Bob. Um, I think we've got time for one final question, and I uh, continue to review the inbound questions. We've got some some really good ones um, and some really thought-provoking things that, uh, as I mentioned before, we will respond to every one of the questions uh, that are that have been uh, submitted. And so I encourage, actually, folks, while we while we ask this final uh, question and we respond to it, enter your questions into the box before we uh, finish up the, the session, uh, and we will make sure to respond to it. We've got a plethora of, of topics here that we've seen, everything from gala events uh, to planned giving uh, to um, those kind of uh, not hit or not providing a direct service to the hardest hit. Those kinds of things uh, we're going to make sure that we're, we're getting on top of. Uh, but we've got one final question here. I'm going to come back to Rick. Uh, I think it is related a little bit to what we were talking to before with some of the campaign activity and, and kind of staffing, and we've seen a few questions come through uh, the box on that. And, and this one's about whether or not to uh, postpone the campaign activity, um, and then how do you position that to leadership uh, when there is that discomfort and, and uh, kind of a readiness to, to pause? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I, I think our um advice would be to for all of our organizations that are in campaigns right now and what we learned from 2008 2009 2010 is to not delay or pause or stop or cancel campaign activity um, we the, the the way to uh, to communicate the plan to leadership say uh, we want to be sensitive we right now are adjusting to the current environment it is um, an uncertain time but we don't want to put anything on pause right now because long term that will do significant damage to our overall financial prospects and the work that we're doing, whether it is building a new wing, a gymnasium, doubling our endowment, all those really important things, um, adding uh, you know, programmatic funding for faculty and staff, financial aid and access. So we want to be sensitive. We want to communicate this personally to people. We don't want to do mass emails or those kinds of things. We want to talk through it. We do want to rely on our experience, which says we, um, you know, we do need to, to stay the course, but make adjustments, be flexible, and think long term. Excellent. Rick, thank you so much. Thanks to Lindsay and, and Bob uh, as well for uh, the time and, and these sharing the lessons learned uh, through the crises of the past and, and really through even these past couple of weeks. Um, we know that things will continue to evolve and continue to change, and so we will commit to uh, conducting more of these engagements uh, and, and webinars to share our perspectives and uh, lessons along with our clients. Um, this session will be available for download from our website. Uh, we will have a fully recorded session uh, with the materials, again, sent to each of you uh, who have attended. We do thank you for your time and for joining us today. Uh, on behalf of all of us here at CCS Fundraising, uh, we appreciate everything that you do. And thanks again. Thanks, Brian.